Okay, so this video came about because I posted a photograph of a venue that I arrived to. And as a joke, I kind of put everything that was going through my mind as a photographer. What the windows were doing, what color the floor was, what type of ceiling was it. And uh, I thought it was a good idea for a video for people who are interested in shooting events, maybe you do weddings, receptions. And I think this could be helpful identifying problems and maybe what some of the solutions are. Now, one of the problems of being a professional photographer is in any situation, when you walk into a room or a venue, you realize that there's infinite possibilities for how to get a photograph. And part of your job is to sort of, you know, whittle down the best and kind of pick the best one that works for the situation. And I equate this whole professional photography fiasco going on in your head with two things. One is Iron Man and another one is football. Let me explain. Iron Man in his helmet is constantly receiving information. And so as a photographer, those are your eyes. You look around, but instead of just seeing the room, you see little bits of information, white wall, tall ceiling, gray floor and all of this information is fed into your little photography brain and then you as iron man woman <laughs> you could take this information and decide as soon as you know what all these little potential pro or what the room is giving you doesn't have to be a problem then you kind of as the photographer know what you want to do and that's sometimes very challenging because you know, there's multiple ways that you can go. And if you're like me, I kind of sometimes get a little anxious with, hey, I could do this, but I could also go wide. I could th shoot with three lights. So sometimes you need to like rein in all this information and figure out what the best way to do it, to take the shot is. And that's analogy number two, football. And by football, I mean American football, you know, not that other one that, you know, no one watches. The one here in America where we don't use our feet. In football, the quarterback runs a play. He tells all his players what he's going to run. But then sometimes he comes up to the line and looks around and realizes there's a problem. The defense is coming to kill him. So what he wants to do is call an audible. An audible is where he'll quarterback will turn around, look around, and actually change the play. Line. Hey, here we go. Hey, hey, let's go. Mama Georgia. Mama Georgia. So that he doesn't get killed. <laughs> and I think that photography is the same way. If you have a plan, a set plan, based on your Iron Man helmet that told you all the problems and what you can do, you whittled it down to the shot you want to take or the way you want to shoot. But all of a sudden, something happens. You have to be able to call an audible and change your plan. A perfect example of this is if you are, you know, like for example, if you like shooting with lights on location and you wanna shoot maybe high speed sync, which is a little involved, your settings, but all of a sudden the family shows up and there's a two year old there. Now, <laughs> you may have to call an audible because setting up lights, sometimes it's a little bit slower and kind of removes you from interacting with kids. So in that situation, I would call an audible and put the lights away and sort of use the natural light as best as I could because I know I'll get better shots if I'm a goofball and I start interacting with the kids so that they forget the camera. That's one example of calling an audible. The other one could be is at an event, I usually shoot very nice formals of my families as they come, but there was a couple of times where, you know, the family's just completely late or the car doesn't show up. That's what happened recently. And the shot, I usually plan three shots. And as the time is going on, you know, it becomes three shots, becomes two shots, two shots become one shot. In that case, you definitely are calling an audible, but because you assess the room and you assess the problems, you can figure out that you could take a shot quicker and of course, all of this depends on how well you know your gear. What can your lights do? How much power do you, if you grab a light, you should be able to know how much power uh, around ballpark, uh, how much light that will give you at a certain ISO, for example. Knowing your gear, 
uh, having all your information Iron Man style and being able to call audibles will make you a great event photographer. Okay, the first thing I always assess at a venue is the size. Is it a big room or is it a small room? If it's a large room, my flash will have to work a little harder because the light, usually when I shoot, I usually bounce the flash behind me like so, behind and, and right. And if the room is very, very, very large, that means that my flash powers have to be turned up a bit so that they could reach the ceiling and then come back down. And if the room is smaller, I know that flash can be bounced off walls left and right, which is not always the case in a larger hall and also off the ceiling. So the size of the room is the first thing I check. The second is color of my surroundings. My favorite are grays, whites, and any kind of neutrals. You have no idea how nice it is to walk into a venue and be like, ah, oh, they painted the walls white, thank you. And uh, if the ceilings are nice and medium-ish, you know you could get good light on your clients. After I check the size of the room and the color of the room, I check the floor. If it's a white dance floor, that's really good too because the light will bounce up, down, and back up again and you get very soft light. Next, I usually assess the ceiling's uh, angles because if it's a flat ceiling, that's totally fine for bouncing light and having it come right back at you. But if sometimes there's venues where the ceiling is completely curved, there, you know, the if you stand in the wrong spot, and you try to you know photograph someone the light won't bounce forward it'll actually bounce backward so you have to be careful with angles this is also the case when you're shooting in tents uh you know like these white outdoor tents there's there's an angle ceiling there's a perfect place where the light will fall on your subject but there's a spot where there's like you know the light goes the wrong way so i always check angle of the ceiling Next, for portraits and family portraits, I always check to see how much distance I have and how far away can I get from the background. I'm always looking for the furthest distance where I could use like an 85 or higher. I can place my family and they have a lot of room behind them. Could be a golf course, could be the up lighting, but I kind of want them to stand out. This is not always the case. Sometimes we're just in a little 10 by 12 room and I have to use a wider lens. Uh, so I want to know distance is the next thing that I assess, okay? Next, after checking out the room and making sure I'm kind of happy and where I can photograph the family, I will usually see where I can set up lighting for the night. I usually have a very large light stand that I put as my disco light, something that'll be shooting behind the people. So it's usually by the DJ, it's by the stage, but you can't always place the light in a very safe place. So I'm always checking to see where can I put my light. In the car, I have like a C-stand, which is heavier with sandbags. Do I need that? Or can I maybe clamp my light? Sometimes I clamp my light to like a beam or something. Safety, I always think safety there. My light, knock on wood, hasn't fallen on anyone. It hasn't fallen on me, <laughs> more importantly but I check to see where I can put my lighting. And then after I kind of have everything set up in my mind of how I'm gonna shoot, entrances, people, I'll photograph my hands with all the lighting so I can see what the, you know, the lighting looks like on my hand. I'll set a white balance and I'm ready to go. All right, so let's talk about the venue that I posted about. This was a little bit challenging because it, it's always challenging when there's changing conditions, changing whether the room is changing, the sun is changing, or you need to move from location to location. So a popular one that is a pain is if you're shooting indoors with incandescent, but there's like a little deck outside that is in you know, natural light. In that case, I recommend if your camera has a bank of custom functions, you could just you know, have one be for flash and then turn off your flash and switch to custom function two, which is set for maybe aperture priority and you can shoot outside with no flash, the right white balance, all that stuff. So the first thing that I noticed when I came into the venue was that this is <laughs> this is in Manhattan. It's called the, the Sunset Room, which I already knew was going to be a problem. The windows face New Jersey, and this is where the sun sets. So the sun would be streaming through these windows towards the end of the event. Now, luckily, it was an early enough event where the sun was at a higher angle. So the sun is coming at a higher angle. Here's another look of the room. 
And when I'm looking around, I'm looking, like I said, for that distance. So I know that the length of the room this way is the longer way. Um, and I'm not getting much distance this way, but at a 1.4, 1.8, I could get good separation from my subjects. I did do a portrait of the kid here really quickly. They, you know, they, the family arrived right when the guests arrived, so I could only grab them for a quick shot. So I used this as a framing sort of mechanism, this spot here. And the other things I noticed is I really couldn't bounce off the ceiling because the ceiling was wood and also had this irregular shaped beams. Anytime, anytime you have chandeliers or beams on the ceilings, beware because your flash will bounce, you know, in all kinds of strange places. So that's what I have going on here. Um, the floor was gray, which was, uh, or it was like a neutral color, which was decent. I also always do a, a shot of my color checker passport and also of a gray card so that I have that for later. Um, but one of the challenges I knew was what direction would I be shooting at? So if I shot in this direction, you know, if someone's standing here and I'm shooting them, I knew that I would have good natural light because if you look outside, this is the little deck that's out here. The sun was definitely here, but moving slowly as the time went on. So outside here, uh, my, my uh, grandparents here have a beautiful soft light on them because I know that this is white, this is gray, and the sun is kind of just softly hitting them. So we have good light on them out there. If people were to face the window, they would have good light on them. So I was happy about that. And even the light is so soft that um, it kind of wraps around you know, light doesn't completely make a U-turn, <laughs> but um, we don't have any harsh shadows here. The light, even if someone is side lit, is very soft. Food looks great in this lighting, nice and soft. Here you can see, even if someone's facing the other way, this is all beautiful soft light. So, so far so good, right? Very easy, almost any photographer can sort of all shoot in one direction. And I knew that, I knew that this, the natural light would be my go-to. Anytime I could face people towards the natural light, I would. Now, I also knew that if people were close to the window versus far from the window, a couple of things happen. If you're closer to the window, the light was a little bit more pleasing. Further from the window, the catch light is just a little smaller because the windows get smaller. And then you have to be careful. If you raise your ISO, you may get some of the room lights that start to appear in, in people. That wasn't too much of a problem here. But uh, just beware of that. If you raise your ISO, the room's lights may come into play. Now the sun started creeping in. So now out on the deck, the bright sun is starting to reach the windows. And remember, it's starting to come in like this. So these people are having a good time outside, but I'm starting to get a little, what am I going to do? And this is where you Iron Man assess the room and you should be able to come up with solutions. Now I will mention one thing, like I'll put this picture up. Now again, I got a little lucky here because the sun was a little less harsh here because the clouds were sort of going in and out. But just remember that moments and emotion will always be lighting. So this moment right here between family members is it's better to capture it and who cares about it. It could be harsh lighting. Moments will always be lighting. So for example, this is beautiful soft lighting, but it's more about the kid, the pink, <laughs> ice cream, the pink dress, the pink hat, um, and just that moment right there. Here's direct sunlight coming into the room later on in the event. This is towards the end, but um, it's okay. He looks fine. He's lit well. The colors are good, and I don't mind if there's a little harsh sun on someone. It totally works. But now I have to assess, what if I want to shoot towards the windows? I have to decide what I want to do, and that is something that is something you should be ready for as an event photographer is what if the sun all of us what if the party was later and the sun is completely coming into the room well people hire you people pay you the big bucks because you have to say i got this it's nothing is a, nothing should be a surprise in a venue or in a situation you have to be able to call an audible you have to be all of a sudden if it's like been cloudy and you're super happy and all of a sudden the sun starts streaming in you should be calm, call an audible, and break out whatever solution you have. Now, some people will overexpose. That's one solution. For example, here's the light coming in from the windows, 
And this is where the family is starting to do the hora. It's kind of a key moment in a bar mitzvah. Um, we, they start holding hands and circling. They put the kid in a chair. And I had to decide on the fly, what direction was I going to shoot in? With the natural light or with a, against the natural light and maybe fill with flash? So because it was like an uncontrolled situation, I knew that I was going to not shoot from this side here. I was going to shoot more from this side so people had broad lighting on them. And that worked great. You know, we got great shots of, you know, people in the horror. We got great shots of kids in the chair. The only problem is I didn't love the background shooting this way. It was a little awkward. There was some construction piping. So what I did instead was I put on my my rogue flash bender and I knew, audible, that I could turn around and photograph. I could expose kind of enough where you see people. You know, so maybe like ISO 800 or so, 640, shutter speed 160th. I'll put that here because people always ask me, what are the set what are the settings? Maybe the sync speed, 1 200th, and maybe ISO 800 to 1250 kind of thing. And then just decide what I want my flash power to be. Now, why am I using this instead of bouncing? Well, because remember, the ceiling was brown. There is a white wall, but I wasn't always facing that wall. This other wall over here was brown, so I would have to like use the flash bender sometimes, bounce other times. But here's just a kiss of light. And what's cool is you are, have a little bit more, more control of the situation so you could photograph a little bit more as things happen, action with your flash. I even added a second light here to have a little bit of a DJ sort of cool light situation going here. You could see it on the kid's hair here. So I have my own light going there. So just remember, Iron Man and football. <laughs> I hope that helped you. Please hit like. This video wasn't sponsored by anyone, so subscribe or something. All right, I'll see you next time.